Welcome everybody for our, our weekly uh, seminar series at the Department of Marine Geosciences. Today we are extremely honored to host uh, Professor Anik, uh, Anil Gupta, uh, Anil Kumar Gupta from the Indian Institute of Technology in Karapur in India. Um, a little bit of uh, information about um, Dr. Anil. He serves as a professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the Indian Institute of Technology in Karapur. He was also the former director between 2010 and 17 of the Vadia Institute of Himalayan Geology in Dehradun in India. His teaching interests include applying micropaleontology, paleoceanography, and marine geosciences. With a focus in Indian monsoon, Gupta has made contributions to fields of micropaleontology, paleoclimatology, paleoceanography, with a special reference to the Indian monsoon system. He carried uh, publication, the publication of Inventory of Glacial Lakes of Uttarakhand. More than 179 of his articles have been published in high impact journals like Nature Science, Nature Geoscience, Scientific Report, Geology, Geophysical Research Letters, Paleoceanography, and Paleoclimatology, and Paleo 3. Uh, in order to understand the history of Indian monsoons variability as well as ocean oceanic changes in the Indian Ocean, Gupta has a long history of science acumen and research nuances. He has studied benthic and plantic foraminifera as well as their stable isotope from ocean drilling programs cores. At timescales ranging from decadal to millennial and orbital, he has made contribution to the knowledge of past behavior of the Indian monsoon system and ocean circulation. His research includes the first description of Indian Ocean Depot in the Paleo record of, and the documentation of bone cycles in the Paleo record of the Indian monsoon region across the Holocene. Anil Gupta received a numerous awards. In 2010, he received the TWAS Prize for, from the World Academy, Academy of Sciences in Trieste. In 2012, he he was granted with the Sir Bose National Fellowship by the Department of Science and Technology in New Delhi in India. The National Research Council of the United States of America awarded him as a Senior Research Fellowship Award in 2001 to work at the National Ocean, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, in Boulder, Colorado. In, in 1991, um, sorry, 1999, Gupta serves, received the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Fellowship to work at Shimane University in Japan as a senior fellow. He is a fellow of all science academics of India and fellow of, of the World Academy of Sciences for the advancement, advancement of science in developing countries. He's also a recipient of the National Mineral uh, award from the Ministry of Coal and Mines in New Delhi, New Delhi in India in 2000 and... Um, Two. 2000. 2000, thank you. I'm, I'm also accepting people in the <laughs> Zoom, so I'm watching two screens, so sorry. I think that should be fine. It's more than enough. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the last, Dr. Dr. Gupta has received... Uh, I've recently been elected to the Council of the World Academy of Sciences for the Advance of Science in Developing Countries until 2006. So with this word, he has an amazing background. And today he's going to talk about the Indian monsoon system and South Asian societies during the Holocene. So yeah. the podium thank is you more. so much, uh, Nicholas, for thank you very uh, much. Intro <laughs> yeah, introducing me. Um, I, it was my long dream, in fact, to have uh, some interaction with my colleagues from Israel because India and Israel um, have many common, uh, you know, um, backgrounds, goals, and uh, aspirations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, space in the minds of uh, most of us because we know how Indian Army uh, help in uh, defeating the uh, enemy forces to free Haifa from Ottoman Empire. That was way back in 1918. So thank you, uh, Nicholas. But um, 
um, yeah, so I, I'm basically a trained as a geo geologist, but uh, as a micropalentologist, but over the last 20 years, I developed some interest to use these uh, geological tools and understanding how the climate has behaved, mainly the climate of the Indian Ocean has behaved during the last 20,000 years or so. So my PhD work was on the long-term uh, changes in the uh, Indian monsoon system. And uh, I was the first uh, micropalaeontologist who has done PhD work on deep sea drilling project course. Uh, so that was the neogene. And uh, in 2002, uh, I had a very short interaction with Dave Anderson, who was working at National Oceanographic uh, Administration, atmo uh, administration uh, that is NOAA, Atmospheric Ad Administration. And uh, he encouraged me to uh, squeeze my uh, length of time from Neogene to the last 20,000 years. And that is how I began to work on ocean drilling program course from the Arabian Sea. So this is my uh, uh, presentation, not only uh, from my, can you see it in slide mode now? No, we, we, we don't see the presentation. Okay. I think you need to share the presentation down there in the green bottom. Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, now we see. You can see, and uh, is it in slide mode now? Yeah, now, exactly now, yes. And is the screen moving up and down? Yes. Okay, so How to remove this uh, screen from the middle? Uh, are you seeing uh, a small screen in the middle of the slide, or no? We we see we see the PowerPoint. It's okay. You, okay, you can, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is the uh, background picture which I had in uh, two thousand twenty one. It's a lake in the state of eastern state of Orissa. So initially I was working on marine sediments where we were analyzing foraminifera, mainly the benthic foraminifera to understand changes at the bottom of the sea. Then I switched to the uh, content to records and for the last six, seven years, when I was director at Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology in Dehradun, I began to work on lake sediments and cave stalagmites. Uh, so I, my idea was that what these uh, marine proxies record signals about the climate of the Indian Ocean and uh, how the continental proxies respond to these changes on land. So we uh, selected few lakes from the different parts of uh, India and also cave uh, stalagmites from the northeastern state of Meghalaya and from Central Indian Ocean, uh, Central Indian region of Chhattisgarh. So this is the, uh, this is one lake in the state of Risa. If uh, you are aware about the climate of the Indian Ocean region, it is mainly dominated by the Indian monsoon system. So we have monsoon beginning in the first week of June or on 31st of May, it uh, touches the coast of Kerala. And then it moves as the monsoon drop moves northwestward, the monsoon, you know, moves to the, uh, follows the trough. And uh, this basically is uh, governed by the uh, intertropical convergence zone, which is a band of cloud. So following the monsoon season, so this was September month when I clicked this photograph and one can see it's all green in fact. So following the monsoon month, the Indian land mass uh, witnessed 
you know, plentiful of productivity in all these spheres, whether these are small uh, strains of bacteria or uh, virus, or it is vegetation or agricultural produce. So we have uh, warm and humid uh, conditions with lots of precipitation. So that makes the uh, most of the land beautiful and uh, green. So I, uh, this uh, talk I divided, I will be using both my work from the uh, Arabian Sea, which I have you know, carried out over the last few years and uh, uh, lakes as well as uh, spilothames, which are nothing but cave stalagmites, uh, cave carbonates. So if you are aware about the uh, tropical region, tropics are dominated by a few monsoon systems. And uh, monsoon is nothing, but it is basically the reversal in the wind system. So during one season, you have one direction of the wind. In the other season, you have a different direction of the wind. So wherever you have land and sea, you have change in the wind direction because of the change in the thermal gradient between land and the sea. So in the tropics, if you see, we have uh, over Africa, the African monsoon system. In South Asia, we have Indian monsoon system. Then we have toward the China side, we have East Asian monsoon system. And then Indonesian and North Australian region is governed by an, a monsoon system, which is Australasian monsoon system. And this is the region which is full of moisture source. It houses some of the world's most diverse ecosystems, dense forest, or rainy forest, major glaciers are also housed in the uh, Tibetan Himalayan region, and then we have um, we have a very dense network of the uh, rivers. <clears throat> uh, and th these uh, conditions suit for the uh, you know population to sustain. So this is also the region that houses words. Uh, uh, most dense uh, population after the world. I think it is one third of the world population that is housed in South Asia alone. <clears throat> if you let, look at the climate timeline, most of the earlier studies were carried out by mathematicians and physicists. So it was Joseph Fourier who actually realized the, uh, uh, the uh, importance of a glass greenhouse and uh, he, uh, suggested that the Earth's atmosphere behaves like, say, like a, uh, uh, like a glass greenhouse. And later on, um, the uh, Swedish physicist Arrhenius defined the greenhouse effect, that is trapping of heat by the atmosphere. And then you can see a series of scientists who have done uh, work on different aspects of climate variability and ocean uh, uh, atmosphere interactions. In India, we uh, also joined the race in, uh, you know, doing, carrying out the climate research and the first institute that was fully dedicated for this research is based in Pune, which is in the Mara state of Maharashtra. It was established in 1962, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. And uh, then we have individual institutions where the uh, research on climate and uh, air sea interaction is being carried out. In uh, last few decades, CLEVAR, that is the climate variability uh, program, has uh, identified uh, around 12, 13 hotspots or switch and choke points, which are also relevant for policy. And these are often known as policy relevant tipping elements in the climate system. You can see in the tropics, we have Indian monsoon system and in the Pacific region, we have El Nino Southern Oscillation. These are the two major systems which are quite uh, closely related and one influence uh, is the other one. <clears throat> and we have little change uh, in, in one of these, then we see the, it's, it's a consequent effect which is more pronounced in other climatic, uh, you know, subcomponents. So, as a geologist, we uh, need to have uh, the proxies. Uh, how to, you know, as a geologist, we 
are curious to know how monsoon has behaved in the past and uh, we would like to use certain geological uh, proxies or geological tools to understand these changes. So we have both uh, proxies in the marine system, in the oceans, we have proxies on land. So marine proxies are mainly the oozes and uh, these are rich in foraminifera and uh, nanofossil as well as uh, um, as well as the ostracods and other uh, small microfossils. And we analyze their population as well as uh, their geochemical signals like stabilized slopes of or oxygen and carbon. On continents, we have proxies which are very good, in fact, in understanding the past precipitation changes or cave stalagmites. We analyze oxygen isotope ratios in uh, these uh, cave carbonates and uh, uh, then we re try to reconstruct the changes in the precipitation. Lake sediments are also being used, but the problem with the lake sediments is the dating problem. Sometimes we have lots of mixing from the shallow sources. We have uh, uh, landslide problems. Sometimes we have uh, vertical mixing due to certain tectonic disturbances. So ages, age, dating of lake sediments is quite tricky. And one is to identify a lake that can give pristine uh, record of climate change. Then we have ice cores, and then of course we have um, uh, glacial moraines and uh, tree ring. <clears throat> the uh, marine proxies, uh, you know, the, the role played by deep sea drilling project and ocean drilling program has been very important in providing the long undisturbed course to. Uh, analyze marine proxies. And uh, most of you might be aware of this program. It began with uh, the deep sea drilling project way back in 1966 with the Challenger, Glomer Challenger as its um, operational ship, which was replaced by Jordan's resolution. And now we have CHECU. So from DSDP to <clears throat> IODP, this program has drilled a uh, long course from almost every part of the world ocean and provide it to scientists who are actively engaged in uh, marine climate research on both uh, time scales. So in um, many sediments we have found both uh, mainly the foraminifera have been very, you know, are quite useful in understanding the uh, changes in uh, or past variability in, in climate. One of them is the Globicher in the Bloides. It is a subpolar planktic foraminifer, but in the tropics, it is found in coastal upwelling settings. Um, then we have Globicher in Ordis <clears throat> River, which is a mixed layer species. It is also a temperature sensitive species. Sometimes we use benthic foraminifera where water depth is not very, very large, uh, where water depth is say, around 1000 meters. Then we also look at and the forums to uh, surface conditions. Uh, so in Planktic Forum, we have Buloides, which is an upwelling indicator in the tropical regions. We have River, which tells about the mixed layer, you know, change in the mixed layer. And then we have a <clears throat> Planktic Forum river that tells about changes in the thermocline, that is shoaling and deepening of the thermocline. Uh, on land, we have uh, spolothemes. So we analyze each layer. Uh, if you are aware of uh, these cave stalagmites, they are, you will find very fine layers which reflect uh, year to year or, or maybe subdecadal changes. So you extract uh, these uh, the, the, the material from these uh, caves, which is nothing but uh, calcite or, or limestone, and then you extract at every one third of a millimeter or half a millimeter interval that gives you a, a very good resolution of even, you know, uh, sub annual to annual or maybe sub decadal. Uh, lake sediments are also quite useful. We have uh, done a study from several lakes, in fact, uh, in the last few years, but lakes have, lake sediments have a problem where we have uh, mixing from the shallow regions where landslide sometimes, you know, bring uh, uh, or introduce noise in the uh, 
in the sediment column. Uh, ice cores have been collected from both northern as well as southern hemispheres. We have NGRIP GSP2 from the north, and then we have Bosto from south. Free rings have been uh, analyzed, and the oldest uh, you know ages which we can have from the uh, free rings could be around thousand years, not more than that. So on the basis of these uh, proxy records, some of the best high resolution uh, proxy records of climate change from tropics and polar regions have been from the oceans like Oman Marge in the Arabian Sea, from Peru region margin, which is in the Pacific, Agulhas current, which is in the South Atlantic. And ice cores from both North and South have uh, provided us undisturbed record of climate change. And from the tropics, we have Bulia, Tunde, Dasope from Tibet region in China. And uh, from Spilothames, some of the best Spilothame records uh, has been generated from Chinese caves or Chinese uh, stalagmites like Dong and Hulu. From India, Dandak, and Mamlu, and, and from urban region is Oti. Mamlu is one which uh, the uh, climate people might be knowing. The Holocene has been classified into three now, North European, Greenlandian, and uh, the uh, other one is uh, Meghalayan. So Meghalayan is the uh, name which is uh, you know, given to an Indian state in the Northeast uh, Meghalaya. So Mamlu falls in that state. And uh, lakes also, we have had very long lake, lake records from Africa and China. And recently we have uh, you know, done uh, some studies in India. And uh, major late quaternary climatic events which have been uh, identified based on very high resolution proxy records are Heinrich events which are the late quaternary cold intervals uh, often uh, designated H, as H1, H2 like that. Then we have Dansgar oyster cycles where uh, also North Atlantic witnessed, um, you know, cooling or uh, pulses of uh, cold intervals. In the Holocene time, Gerard Warren identified 11 events which, during which time uh, lots of uh, cooling activity occurred in the North Atlantic. We call them as bond events. And then we have certain events which uh, have certain duration, like we have last glacial maximum, which was followed by Bolin Elohid Warm. Then we have Younger Dryas, cold event, early Holocene climate took optimum. This was a time when uh, you know the temperatures were higher and it was a wet period. Then we have 4.2 K event, which was a dry event and it has been found mostly in the tropics. Then the Roman War period, this was time when uh, economies in South Asia reached their uh, acme. And then we have medieval climate anomaly, 950 to 1350 AD, and then the Little Ice Age. This was the time when most of these European wanderers, they actually uh, moved from out of uh, Europe and then looked around the world. Chronology plays very important part in climate research. So we need to have good chronology in order to understand the changes and identify these events. So in case of Planck forums, we go maximum up to 30,000 years. We can have very good record. Of course, we have done it up to 40, 45,000 years, but this is the time which, where you have little, little deviation, little noise in the ages. OSL date can take you up to 2 million years, and it is done on fluvial sands. Faunal datums, of course, are used in marine sediments. If you like to analyze uh, long time period records, you have to base of the Pelogene, that is Pelocene, and uh, to the Pleistocene. Series. And then we have ice cores where the chronology is done based on the counting of individual layers and also in the warps. So we come to the Indian monsoon region. Indian monsoon is the lifeline to the people of uh, Indian subcontinent because it uh, controls the water budget of the Indian rivers. The vegetation is controlled by this, the monsoonal precipitation. 
agricultural practices as well as our cultural practices are linked to the monsoon. When we say monsoon, it is mainly the summer monsoon that uh, starts in the first week of June and ends sometime in the later part of September. And in Indian language, we call it as Chaturmas. Chaturmas means four months when the rain uh, falls. And then it also controls ecosystem. The uh, ecological diversity in the uh, Himalayan region uh, is closely linked to the availability of precipitation. Ocean chemistry is another important aspect that uh, is affected by the uh, uh, monsoonal precipitation and of course the economic well-being of one third of the world's uh, human population. Now, it, rains are very important to the Indians right from the ancient times, in fact, and this is one Sanskrit shloka which many of you may not be able to read, but in Sanskrit it says, this is this I have taken from Valmiki Ramayana, you know, Valmiki Ramayana is a, uh, is a historical, you know, account of uh, Lord Ram, and this says, Nav Mas Dratham Garbham Bhaskaras Gavastivhi Itva rasam samudranam dhyao prasute rasayanam. In English, the meaning is for nine months the sky drank the ocean's water, sucking it up through the sun's rays, and now gives birth to a liquid offspring, the elixir of life. So, this Lord Ram says when he was to attack Lanka in search of uh, his wife Sita. <clears throat> so, he was uh, telling to his uh, brother. Lakshma. So, monsoon has been dear to the Indians right from the ancient times. We do not know when our history started. We, we you know, we began with the monsoonal um, um, uh, tales. And later Indians like Kautilya, which, uh, you know, who was the guru of Chandragupta Maurya, is, he wrote uh, Arthashastra, he is also known as Chanakya, Vara Mehir's uh, Brush Sainta, Kalidas, Meghdut, and Kalanas, who has written the history of Jammu and Kashmir. He has written a book, Raj Tarangani, in 12th century AD. All these books talk about clouds and uh, precipitation and the, you know, little bit of about the climate. <clears throat> uh, we published a paper in 2003 where we actually pulled some mentions from Rig Veda and from Athar Veda, as well as uh, Brush Sainta of Baramehir and Arshastra of Chanakya, as well as Raj Tarangani. And we found that those events are very close relation. This is our data, which we published in Nature in 2003. And uh, we superimposed these events and we found that there is some relation between those mentions, which we see in our uh, religious and historical books. So monsoon has been lifeline to the people of Indian subcontinent since the ancient times. And most of the kingdoms that flourished right from the north to the south <clears throat> were mainly along the major perennial rivers, whether, whether it, it is Ganga Yamuna or on the north and west, it is Sindhu and its uh, other tri tributaries. So all these major kingdoms flourished along these rivers because rivers have been the backbone of our civilizations. Now, Indian monsoon is uh, basically it's a uh, system of uh, changes uh, in wind direction during two seasons. So during summertime, we have the winds blowing from southwest to northeast, <clears throat> bringing lots of moisture from the Arabian Sea and southern part of the uh, Indian Ocean and then drop over the interland mass. And uh, the uh, strength of this monsoon precipitation mainly depends on the movement of this low pressure ITCZ as this uh, moves northward, the monsoon trough follows it and then drops the precipitation over the Linden land mass. So basically ITCZ or ITCZ is the function of energy fluxes. During summer, it moves to the north and during the winter time, that is during the boreal winter, the ITCZ moves to the south of the equator and we have reversal in the wind direction. So winds, uh, northeast to southwest and these are mainly the dry winds because not enough moisture is picked by them over the land. <clears throat> so winter monsoon rains are drier as compared to the summer monsoon time. So as the wind direction changes in the two seasons, 
the southwest monsoon and in the northeast <clears throat> monsoon the surface ocean also follows the wind direction changes and you can see the uh, during the summer time the uh, the flow of the surface water is different as compared during the northeast monsoon time and uh, that is how you also see changes in the ocean chemistry and uh, ocean uh, biota <clears throat> So monsoon is uh, the lifeline to the people of uh, Indian subcontinent or people of South Asia. You can see if the monsoon is uh, over intensified, we see lots of floods all over the region and uh, the low lying areas are inundated and people uh, you know, look for the safe uh, places to survive. And when the monsoon fails, then you see the other face of the monsoon, people look for a drop of water even and to fetch for themselves and uh, the animals just uh, die out <clears throat> for the lack of uh, drinking water and we do not have water to irrigate our land. Rivers are the main you know victim of climate change and uh, as the monsoon weakened over the last 5000 years River Saraswati, that was once upon a time a, an important river flowing down from the Himalayan region through the state of Haryana and Rajasthan and dropped into the Arabian Sea, it uh, vanished. So there are different views. In fact, one is climate related, the other one is related to the tectonism, where people say major, major fault probably changed the course of uh, Saraswati River. But there are different views, whatever is the reason climate played a havoc in, the, uh, in sustaining the course of these rivers. And River Saraswati was one of them. Uh, if you look at the uh, other rivers, which uh, we have done you know, some analysis uh, from the uh, city of Calcutta or Kolkata, you can see this is Adi Ganga. Once upon a time, it was such a neat and clean with full of water. And the, these are the temples where people were, uh, you know, taking tip into the river and then offering puja. Uh, that was in 1860, 1880, 1865. But look at this, we have recently done some wheel work in the same, along the same course of the same river in 2019. And you can see how the river has disappeared. There is no water and the, 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 the river course is full of garbage and it cannot carry. And so in some places you can see the eutrophication is so, alarming that even touching of this water is dangerous. <clears throat> so it is so toxic in few places. So climate plus uh, apathy by humans led to the uh, demise of these natural systems. If you look at the, uh, you know, contribution by geologists, that is we look at the paleoclimatic variability or, or change in the climate in the past. So by 18th century, we, uh, found the evidence of climate change in uh, successions of uh, geological ages. And the credit goes to James Hutton, who was among those who found signs of glacial activity in areas in places where, which are too warm for growth of glaciers in the modern times. And uh, Hutton's ideas of cyclic change in the sediment accumulation over different time intervals led to the proposition, which many of the study offers and geology students know as the principle of uniformitarianism. Although this principle was proposed by someone else, but Hutton worked in greater detail on this and then he's credited to this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, proposition of this principle. I was really very, um, I was astonished. I, so far I knew that Hutton was mainly a study offer and a geologist. But I was going through his contributions. I found that he also did some work on, on uh, rains and on climate. And he proposed the theory of rain, which, in which he said, warmer air holds more water vapor and the cooling of air can lead to rain. So this was uh, you know, something very uh, interesting to me. And Hutton studied rainfall and climate data in different regions of the world and conducted concluded that rainfall everywhere is regulated by humidity of the air and changes in the higher atmosphere, which is true in fact, which uh, the atmospheric scientists probably carried on words and 
improved upon it. Another geologist uh, we know is Cesar Emiliani, who was a Italian American. He migrated to the United States, worked with Harold Ure, who was a nuclear physicist and uh, used microfossils in the study of climate research. So he pioneered the use of stable isotopes in uh, paleoclimatic reconstructions, mainly during the quaternary time. And uh, um, Emiliani, then later on, Sam Seven from the same lab, they worked on intensively on the same. Uh, and probably Nick Shackleton also belonged to the same school, who was a pioneer uh, stable isotope geologist and a paleoclimate worker in UK. In 1975, US scientist Wallace Broker put the global warming, you know, we quite often talk about this term global warming due to greenhouse effect as well as due to anthropogenic contributions. So Broker uh, put the term global warming in public domain in a paper he published in Science in 1975. It is titled, Are We on the Brink of a Pronounced Global Warming? And this was the time when uh, people, uh, you know, began to talk about global warming. In India, we have, uh, uh, you know, the modern day research began uh, uh, following the great famines of 1866 and 1877 during British time. This was the time when uh, the country was witnessing lots of famines. Some of these famines were natural and a few were even man-made because Britishers were too ruth ruthless that uh, they, in some time, they actually did not allow the movement of goods from one place to another. <clears throat> so, but uh, in 1866 and then 1868, there was another famine and 1871 was another one. Then the British government asked the, uh, one of uh, the British, Sir John Elliot, uh, to uh, work on the monsoon prediction and uh, India Meteorological Department, you know, before India Meteorological Department came into being, there were small centers in different parts of the country. But uh, to bring all those into one umbrella, India Meteorological Department was established in 1875 and Sir John Elliot was its first Director General of Observations. And H.F. Uh, Blandford was the meteorological reporter. So Blandford began to forecast monsoon, uh, you know, production uh, in the, uh, from, you know, as soon as the India Meteorological Department was established. So following those famines in 1878, Blandford first time used the snow cover in the Himalayan region to predict or to forecast the monsoon strength in the following season. <clears throat> so his idea was uh, that if you have thicker snow over the Himalaya, weaker is the monsoon in the following season. Suppose if the, the snowfall is in the spring of or winter of 2022 or 2023, the monsoon will be weaker in the following summer. And if we have less snow over the Himalayan region, the monsoon strength will be more. So monsoon will be stronger in the following season. So this was his initial prediction, which uh, of course has lots of meaning, but now we have more parameters to use in uh, forecasting the monsoon precipitation. On the long-term, you know, basis, we uh, know Himalaya and Tiburon Plateau played an important role. So it is the geometry of the Indian Ocean land masses and the rising of the Himalayan region that brought significant changes in the monsoon history. And it is believed that after attaining a critical height by the Tibetan Plateau and Himalayas, <clears throat> the monsoon began to form. But my own research says that it, is, it was not only the Himalayan height, but also the gateways, for example, the Tethys and uh, uh, in the in the late in the middle Miocene, and then later in the early Pliocene or, or middle Pliocene time, the closing of the Indonesian Sea. But these also played some role in the evolution of the monsoon system. So our research suggests that monsoon began to develop at around 13 million years ago. This work we published in 2015. 
and it has been accepted by several studies which were followed. Now, where to go to get the best course in the uh, you know, Arabian Sea to analyze the marine proxy is a big challenge. So we have done some Z score analysis using Globigerina boloides, which, in a, which is an upwelling indicator. So upwelling occurs when the monsoon, when the wind strength is strong and the wind speed is stronger, wind drag is strong, the boloides population increases. So we have actually identified a code from the Western Arabian Sea of Oman margin where the monsoon wind stress is maximum, a code from the Eastern Arabian Sea and a code from the Northeastern Arabian Sea. And then we have done that score. We found if you want to know something about the winter monsoon, the Eastern Arabian Sea is more suitable. But if you want to know something about the summer monsoon time, then the Western Arabian Sea of Oman margin is more suited to uh, retrieve a core from this region. And the other one is the uh, Somali coast that is of the African horn or Somali horn in the western part of the, uh, you know, southwestern part of the European Sea. So these are some of the important studies which, have, which we have done in identifying a suitable core for two different types of monsoon system. And this is the fine little jet which is driven by southeast trade winds and uh, it is believed that monsoon precipitation during summertime is more. So it is not the uh, recent changes which you see in the climate or weather pattern. If you look at the last 60,000 years or more history of uh, even monsoon in the Indian Ocean region, you will see very abrupt and significant changes in the strength of the monsoon. So we have a record from the Northeastern Arabian Sea published by my Hartmar Schulz in 1998, then Mark Altabet in 2002 from the Western Arabian Sea that is near Somali coast. And then we compared it with the uh, Chinese cave record and also the GSP2 record from the Greenland. So if you see these, these uh, sudden changes in the, in the strength of the monsoon, they are aligned with what we, uh, we see in the North Atlantic. And in 2003, we published an article in Nature where we found during Holocene time, though the monsoon was most intense in the, intense in the early Holocene time, but we, and uh, after that, it, it kept on weakening. But we also saw at uh, repeatedly at you know certain intervals, we see some, uh, some phases or some uh, intervals of of uh, weak uh, monsoon time. And when we align these, uh, you know, our Holocene record with the uh, bond record from the North Atlantic, we found that during the cold intervals, the summer monsoon weakened. Uh, and we found all these, uh, you know, counterparts of the cooling in the North Atlantic in the Southwest monsoon record from the Oman margin. <clears throat> So this shows that the North Atlantic cooling has a close relation with the monsoon strength. And this is another record from the Western Arabian Sea, which we, uh, we generated from two cores, RC2730 and RC2735. Uh, we found uh, monsoon was quite uh, strong during the medieval climate anomaly. It weakened during the little ice age uh, you can see this was also the time of monitor minimum. And uh, during the last 400 years, monsoon kept on intensifying or uh, monsoon winds kept on uh, uh, intensifying. And this is related with increase in the surface air temperature in the other hemisphere. So what we believe, we have more heating of land, you know, the monsoon wind strength will be stronger. <clears throat> So that was the marine record we have, you know, analyzed from the Arabian Sea. Then we have also done some work on cave stalagmites from the Meghalayan region. And Meghalaya has provided some of the best cave stalagmites uh, for the study of change in monsoon precipitation, which is a function of, uh, you know, delta OIP values in uh, cave stalagmites are a function of transport pathways. That is how far is the source. Uh, distance from the moisture source, and then what is the composition? That is the what is the isotopic composition of the surface water, 
and then of course the amount effect but uh, most important are the surface uh, you know isotop isotopic composition of surface source water air you can see uh, the uh, isotopic composition of surface water this is a high split uh, back tracking of uh, wind trajectories for Chirapunji, which is in is located in Meghalaya. So during pre-monsoon time, during monsoon time, and during post-monsoon time, you can see the delta O18 value of surface water was quite positive in the pre-monsoon time, which was a little more negative during the monsoon time, and it's still more negative during the post-monsoon time. So this is uh, one of the important factors while explaining the delta O18 values in the cave stalagmites or stalathems. Then we have, we have you know another study by Sina and others in you know from Sahaya Cave Uttarakhand, and uh, here also the uh, you know the source is from different regions in different times of the uh, monsoon season during June, July, August, and September. So this is our record, which uh, we generated from Meghale. And uh, one can see the monsoon was quite weak during the uh, last glacial maximum. It uh, strengthened uh, during the bowling LRI, and then again weakened during the younger dryas. But during the early Holocene time, one can see the monsoon precipitation was more because of the strong Southwest monsoon in the Meghale region. We superimpose the solar insulation over uh, the Delta 18 time series of uh, Mamlu cave and we found during more uh, solar insulation, we have uh, the monsoon strength is much more as compared to the less solar insulation. <clears throat> uh, we extended that record from 35,000 years to 45,000 years from the same cave, but using a different uh, sample. And one can see a sawtooth-like pattern in the monsoon precipitation um, from uh, 45,000 years onwards. And uh, one can uh, see different Heinrich events and also Dansgaard oyster cycles in our uh, record. The uh, important part here is that many people have uh, suggested that MIS-3, during MIS-3, the monsoon was much stronger which we did not see, monsoon strength was not significantly very high as compared to the last glacial maximum. So we did not see an extraordinary change during the, during the marine isotope stage three. <clears throat> this is our uh, record from another cave from the Northeast Himalaya, that is from Meghalaya and uh, last thousand year records, you can see downward arrows, they are intervals of droughts and uh, when we looked at India Meteorological Department website, we found that most of these droughts are aligned with the listed droughts in the IMD website. And uh, we found two major, you know, episodes of uh, flooding, probably very heavy precipitation. And, uh, you know, we have lots of cyclones appearing in the Bay of Bengal. They touch the coast of Odisha and West Bengal, and finally they disappear or die down in the state of Meghalaya. Uh, I personally feel that these probably uh, these two peaks probably represent intervals of very heavy precipitation during uh, you know incessant uh, rains by the cyclonic changes. Uh, this is a lake record from uh, from the Leh Ladakh region, Somurari Lake, and though it, this is not very uh, high resolution record, but we found evidence of uh, dry phase around very uh, very close to 4.2 k event, and this probably was a longer event as compared to what we have seen in the Ganga Basin, which uh, was probably around 200 years in age uh, of duration, uh, 200 years duration. So this was the time when the precipitation was uh, much less and most of the lakes in the Ganga Basin began to appear following the, uh, this, this dry phase uh, of 4.2K or uh, 4,200 years event. So majority of the lakes began to appear in the Ganga Basin around 5,000 years ago and they reached their uh, peak in the, uh, following the 4.2K event. 
this is another record very close to city of Lucknow, which is again in the uh, uh, Central Ganga Basin. And uh, one can see the uh, you know heavy precipitation during 6,000 to 5,000 years ago, and the and then we see the uh, much less. And uh, we have done some pollen study in this lake where you know before 5,000 years you see there is no pollen. Uh, this suggests that the lake was a part of the river, Gomti River, and it was at 5,000 years ago that the river began to desiccate or began to change its course, and uh, the lake began to form, and by 4.2 K when the uh, lake was its uh, actual shape. And these pollen uh, records suggest lots of uh, human activity in the area, beginning at around 4.2 kilo years um, ago. And uh, you can see micro -char charcoal, which uh, suggests the presence of uh, stubble burning uh, in the area. Then we have uh, some pollens of cereal that, you know, these are the cereals which were grown by the population in the area. So the pollen record also suggests some influence of human activity in that area. So this is one aspect which we are trying to, you know, uh, learn in, in, in future lake records. <clears throat> this is another uh, uh, lake record from the state of Himachal Pradesh, Rivalsar Lake, and uh, we found very strong, you know, precipitation at around 600 BC to almost 400 AD, around 1000 years, and uh, the, uh, the weakening of the monsoon coincides with the demise of Gupta dynasty. In fact, this was the time when India's economy reached its uh, peak, its acme. And these are in fact uh, also mentioned in the historical records, well documented in the historical record, how Indian economy improved during that time. <clears throat> so we have done some uh, you know, climatic historical uh, comparison using our data from Varshikar Lake and we found the, some of these dynasties, they have their very, you know, their flourishing and demise uh, are coincidental with the changes in the monsoon precipitation. And one can see how these uh, dynasties flourish and then also they had, they saw their demise as, they, as the monsoon weaker. So I'm uh, coming to the end of my talk. Uh, how much time do I have? Do I have still 10 minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, 10 minutes, okay. Okay, so <laughs> the highlights of our studies from the, uh, from the land, from the Arabian Sea, and from other parts of the Indian Ocean, we uh, have uh, identified certain intervals where lots of changes in monsoon precipitation and population response. <clears throat> so during the uh, post younger dryas to early Holocene climatic optimum, we, uh, we we witness increased summer precipitation. Laura Deva is the, uh, in, it is located in the Ganga Basin and uh, we have found the oldest record of rice, which uh, is as old as 12,000 years before present. And 9,000 years ago, we see uh, domestication of plants and animals in the Indian subcontinent, which include wheat, rice, barley, jujube, sheep and goats. So one can see the uh, close relation between the uh, vegetation, agricultural practices with the climatic change. In the late Holocene time, uh, the precipitation began to decrease and we see expansion of wheat and barley farming in Western India and in Ganga Basin. So as we have more winter precipitation, the wheat uh, production began to increase in fact, wheat and barley, because these are winter crops. So initially we had domestication of rice and because it was more uh, summer precipitation, less winter precipitation. And as the winter precipitation increased, we have winter crops also. <clears throat> uh, and for during 4.2 K event, that is 4,200 years uh, event, a major arid phase began in the Indian subcontinent. And this was the time when population displacement began, you know, migration of population one from less precipitation areas to more precipitation areas began. And widespread freshwater lakes appeared in the Ganga Basin and a shift 
towards pastoralism. So from the hunter-gatherer to pastoralism, uh, you know, began the expansion of village life during this time. Following 4.2K event, we see increased human activity and agricultural practices, which were dominated by camp lands in the Ganga Basin and a change in land use pattern, as well as agricultural practices. I said, wheat, you know, more wheat was uh, being uh, sown and, uh, uh, you know, grown in the, uh, in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, from first millennium BC to approximately 500 AD, monsoon was quite good. And we see expansion of rice cultivation in the Ganga Basin. Medieval climate anomaly, which is uh, 950 to 1350, we see wet summer monsoon marked by flood events and better agricultural production. During the Little Ice Age, uh, we see uh, precipitation decreased now, Little Ice Age can be divided into two. The early Little Ice Age was somewhat better as compared to the late Little Ice Age. And uh, we see decline in agriculture produce. This was also the time when Mughals finally were defeated by Marathas and uh, because their uh, tax uh, collection was de declined because of the decline in the agricultural produce. And during the last century, we see recurring extreme events which are probably related to the increased Temperature, uh, we see 210 Leh flood, 200, 2013 flood, where around 10,000 people were killed. And in 2015, we see Kerala flood, and again later we see the Chennai flood in Madras. So, as a uh, geologist, I looked at some archaeological books by Elchin and Elchin and by some other British authors and Indian authors, and I found lots of uh, archaeological sites uh, were concentrated, which are dated from 11,000 to 7,000 years ago in the northwestern part of Indian subcontinent. And most of these sites are in, the, in, the, uh, in Pakistan, and few are in the northwestern part of India. So our journey began somewhere in the Mehergarh, that is what uh, believed, maybe 11,000 years or 12,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago. And uh, as uh, the precipitation declined, most of these archeological sites spread in the Eastern part of Indian subcontinent. So I believe probably the, as the monsoon was always, you know, precipitation was always more in the Eastern part as compared to the Western part of Indian subcontinent, people probably began to move to areas where, uh, you know, more precipitation was, or more water was available for drinking and for agriculture purpose. So this was Saraswati River, which also probably declined or disappeared around the same time, 5,000 years to 4,000 years ago. We have dated um, uh, some sand from the bed of the uh, this Saraswati River, you know, OSL dates we have, uh, where we found that uh, the river probably disappeared around the same time, 5,000 to 4,000 years ago. This was once upon a time a very big river, but now we see a very small, you know, uh, rivulet, or in some places it is Nala type. It is not a major river now, no more. <clears throat> but we see lots of, you know, sand outcrops, sandy outcrops all along its course, which are some in some places we see buried channels. So this is a cartoon which uh, which we uh, 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 which we made and published in 2003 in uh, Current Science. So this is how as the monsoon. Uh, began to weaken the rainwater harvesting structures were built by the population. And uh, in Rajasthan, we see the people have lived even during the peak of aridity. So this is how in, you know, when the aridity began around 4,200 years ago, the structures were like this, then we have some little bit deeper than we, when the precipitation was more than like this. And when the arid phase was, um, you know, when the technology was developed, then people began to make, uh, you know, more uh, uh, fortified structures to harvest the rainwater uh, for the lean use in lean period. So we have recently identified more lakes to analyze and, uh, uh, you know, uh, generate the high quality data to understand 
behavior of the uh, Indian monsoon, these lakes are located mainly in the eastern part of the uh, Indian land mass or Indian nation that is in the state of West Bengal and Odisha. Well, the, these two states where we have not analyzed much lakes. So I come to an end and uh, these are some of my collaborators where uh, I, who I would like to acknowledge. Uh, my student from IIT Bhavaneshwar, Rajkumar Singh, then Ai Cheng from University of Minnesota, he, he's now in China. Steve Clemens is from Brown University, US. Dave Anderson was at NOAA. He's now doing some uh, personal work. Bern Wunemann from Germany, and then the scientist from Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology. Uh, Dr. Pankaj Kumar uh, has extended all the help for AMSC 14 dates. We have several dates, in fact, uh, without which we our data would not have been that uh, result. And then my other students, Shreya Gupta, Jeet Majumdar, Arun Kaushik, they are still working with me. And uh, finally, I thank Professor Nicholas Waldman for inviting me to give this uh, talk to the students and his colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we we'll really appreciate ver very much your, your talk. It is really impressive the amount of information that you can gather from the Indian subcontinent. Um, I, I open the podium for questions from yeah, the audience. Sure. So if somebody has a question, please, please step in. And, um, I do have a small question if I can ask. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, it was, the talk was great. Um, I have like uh, one question related to your um, late Holocene data set. So you mentioned there were various periods of medieval climate uh, anomaly. There were warming phase, cold, cold phase. So what were the forcing mechanism that led to this precipitation change, like solar, uh, volcanic, and so like that? Yeah, during the medieval climate anomaly, it is mainly the solar forcing, but during the uh, little ice age, it, it is both. We have both um, volcanic eruptions as well as uh, solar insulation because we see moderate minimum. This coincides with the uh, solar minima, and also during this time, lots of volcanic eruptions happen. So, little ice is one which. Um, uh, which uh, has both, beautiful. but medieval climate anomaly, it is mainly the solar influence we found. <clears throat> yeah, more questions? Yeah, Nicholas, I have one question. Yeah, sure. Hi, Professor Anil. Uh, a really nice and wonderful talk. Uh, I recall you meeting in Wadia Institute of Technology while I was visiting one of uh, inspired faculty there, Dr. Praveen Kumar Mishra. So okay. I had an interaction with you and I discussed some of the things with you as well. So that is the one thing which, like as a young career researcher, I am still fascinating about Indian monsoon. So in your opinion, sir, like uh, what is that one particular thing which is still missing, like one particular puzzle that is still missing from the, you know, understanding the Indian monsoon? And then you would ask the young researchers to address that particular question. So like, what is that one question or one puzzle? Yeah, the, the uh, you know, most of the information we have um, uh, about the monsoon variability, the, uh, the main puzzle is whether uh, the monsoon has linkages with the, in, you know, if you talk about the Holocene part or maybe last 20,000 years uh, report, whether monsoon has uh, close linkages with the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or it is in an ocean dipole, or uh, it is the uh, North Atlantic uh, climate, or it is the Southern Hemisphere climate. This is one part which uh, people can do. The other, uh, you know, information which is not available is uh, how the vegetational changes happen. You know, we know the intervals when the precipitation was uh, more and the intervals when the precipitation was less, but we do not know how the land use pattern changed with time, how the 
uh, agricultural practices. Uh, like we have done just one, uh, you know, exercise very close to Lucknow, but we are we do not know uh, what happened during the early Holocene time. What happened during the Bowling Alaroy time? What happened during the last glacial maximum? So for that, uh, I, I do not know what is your background, but if you have some leaning towards, uh, you know, a study of pollen, then I think that is worth uh, doing it. Most of the uh, students which I have seen that they are collecting short course and uh, slicing it very at very coarse interval. And uh, finally, they do maybe some small publication, but that is not worth of it. So my message to the students is that you go for uh, a, whether it is a small or, or large core, but the resolution must be high so that you can, um, you can identify signals even at, uh, you know, if not seasonal level, but at least annual to uh, sub-decadal, maybe five years, you know, resolution or four years resolution. We have done it in fact. In uh, Revolts Lake, where we uh, we could attain a resolution of three years every sample. Yeah, thank you, sir. What is your good name? Sir Ankit Yadav, Doctor Ankit Yadav. Acha, I may not be remembering. I do not know. Yeah, sir, it was long back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more questions from the audience. Well, probably there are more questions, but I will share the uh, the email because we are getting too late already. And if you will agree, we will uh, close the session for today. Okay. Please, uh, thank you very much again. And please let me know if you would like to stay in touch with us. I, I can put you uh, in, the, in the emails for our future uh, events. Oh, sure, always. It will be my pleasure. Thank you very much again. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, of course. Sure, sure. That would be my pleasure. Thank you. Honor. Have a great, great afternoon. You too. Thank you very okay. much. Noshka. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.